Well, this evening we'll continue through our study in the book of First Samuel. We've come to chapter 23. So uh, if, if you haven't yet, you can turn in your Bible to chapter 23. We've been watching an, uh, a period in David's life where while he has already been anointed to be king by the prophet Samuel, uh, he isn't yet the king. And in fact, in Saul's kingdom and in Saul's household, Saul is slowly but surely going insane. As Saul has walked away from God and uh, going into rages, he's threatening not only his son Jonathan, but David. And uh, last week we saw that as David then took it on the run, uh, made a compact with Jonathan, if I shoot the arrow beyond you, uh, then run away. And he did run away. And, and fundamentally, he will see Jonathan again. Um, but basically, this is kind of the end of David's time uh, in the, 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 the throne, the kingdom, uh, in royalty. He's going to spend now uh, over a decade on the run. A wanted man and uh, along the way we saw he went to the priest's house at Nob and Ob Nob and there he asked for the showbread to eat and and uh, we talked about that last week he was able to get provisions he was able to get the sword uh, Goliath's sword that David used to take his head off with and got some provisions and in chapter 22 um, he went and found refuge he found a a hiding place in a cave in a cave in uh, um, Adullam, and so while he's there, the what it said the distressed, the de indebted, and the discontented gathered to him, and he he had a little bit of a his own militia, if you will, uh, about 400 men who gathered around him. And uh, they, they will become David's mighty men, right? But um, they start from a, a pretty bad pedigree, but God is going to turn them into a mighty, mighty force of warriors. Um, and then uh, there was a guy there that day when David went to get the showbread and ratted him out to King Saul, Doeg. Doeg says, yeah, this is where he is and that's what he's doing. And Saul, in his insanity, got so incensed that he went up to Nob and had all of the priests butchered. In fact, uh, not only has he threatened to kill his son Samuel or his son Jonathan twice and pinned David to the wall with a spear and, and all different kinds of things, now he's taken out this city of Nob. 85 priests, uh, including the head priest, uh, Himelech, and it said men, women, children, and infants, oxen, donkeys, sheep, this is the extent of his rage, just pure, pure insanity, um, because he's jealous, he's envious of David. And all David has done is tried to build the kingdom and tried to serve his king Saul in all of this. That brings us to chapter 23. Um, David's been on the run. There was one priest that did not get slain in this whole... Uh, his whole thing, Abiathar. And now Abiathar will join David, and we'll see later on, become the, the priest. As David establishes his throne in Jerusalem, Abiathar will be the priest. Um, but this is kind of where we're at right here in verse 23, verse 1, then, keeping on with the narrative, keeping on with the story. Then David, they told David, saying, look, the Philistines are fighting against uh, Keila, and they are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keila. But David's men said to him, Look, we're afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to the Keila, Ke Ke however you say that. I don't know how to say it, Keila. I, I looked it up. I listened to the pronunciation guide, but I don't speak great Hebrew. Uh, how much more if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? So they're concerned, right? They're, they're, they're a ragtag mob. They fled 
Saul and his insanity and his kingdom. They're in distress. They're in debt. They're discontented. They gather, gather around David. He's an honorable man. He's a, he's a warrior. He's a valiant man. And so they're gathering. But they're, they're afraid. They're hiding in caves. And now word comes that there's this city not too far away, uh, basically about five miles away from the cave in Adullam. And the Philistines are raiding them. It's much like we saw with Gilead. And in the, in the book of Judges, they would wait until the harvest and then they would come and they would raid the villages and take all their harvest and, and go away until next year. And this is kind of going on. David hears about it. He says to the Lord, should I go help him? And David's always been about defending Israel. And so he, these are his fellow Israelites. I'll go defend them. But the men say, we're afraid. Not only are we on the run from Saul, but now you want us to get upset with the Philistines? One enemy at a time is enough. Is kind of the attitude of these men. So verse 4, then David inquired of the Lord once again. And, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Um, so he, he didn't. He did. He was going to do it, but he consulted with the people, and the people says we don't think it's a good idea. But God just put it on his heart. He consulted with him again. God says, "Go do it." And this is what a leader does. A leader does what the Lord leads you to do, with or without them. I would imagine had the mighty men said, "We're not going," it'd be another David and Goliath moment. But this is the heart of David. To follow after God, to serve God, to obey God. David is for sure a fallen man, just like every single person that walks the pages of Scripture save Jesus Christ. So you can put, put holes all over his, his history, his testimony, but he had a heart that said, I want to do, I want to try to do what you called me to do. And so they go and they whoop on him, and it says, and they took the cattle, right? Instead of having a cow... They, they took a cow. They had steak for dinner. <laughs> right? And sometimes, isn't that interesting how in the middle of a crisis, when you think everything's going uh, downhill, all of a sudden God turns it around and bam, there you are with a nice ribeye in front of you. Okay? Verse 6. Now it happened when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Keilah, that he went down with an ephod in his hand. Okay, now the ephod is this thing that they would wear um, over uh, their garments. And inside the ephod, there were 12 stones of the tribe of Israel. And inside were the stones, the umen and the thummim, which were the um, lights and perfections. But they would use these to cast lots, to determine if God said yes or no, go or stay, and those kinds of things. And so now Abiathar the priest comes down, with um, the ephod in his hand, verse 7. And Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah. So Saul said, to, said, God has delivered him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. Okay? Now, it's kind of interesting, just coming out of the lips of Saul. Saul is as far from God as a person could be at this point, even though he was touched by God. And even last chapter, we saw him... Uh, the Holy Spirit overcame him, and he fell down and stripped and laid on the ground and prophesied. And you're like, what's going on here? This guy is manic depressive, right? Uh, whatever you would want to term it, he's all over the map. But today, now, in verse 7, oh, God's on our side. God's going to bring David to us. He's went into this city. It's got walls around it. It's got a gate. It's like he's in a bottle. It'll be so easy to go just get him, you know. Um, verse 8, Then Saul called all the people together for war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. When David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. And so it's almost like that which they feared came true. 
Yeah, now it is. The Philistines and Saul. And here we are, and we're in a pickle, and uh, it's all on you, David. What are we going to do? I think we should pray. I think we should ask God, what's going on here? And this is how it's going to turn out. And sure enough, God says, yeah, he's coming. He's coming, all right. Then David said, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? Are they going to rat me out? Are they just going to turn me over like Doeg did? Uh, and the Lord said, they will deliver you. Yep, they are going to rat you out. Verse 13, so David and his men, about 600, it was 400 last chapter. What's going on here, right? As, as we start seeing a hero, as we start seeing somebody who will stand up and, and take the hits and follow the Lord, you know, the reputation of that person grows and more and more and people will, will gather on to that. When you find it, it, all it takes is somebody to stand up. Have you ever noticed in almost every situation that you would find yourself in, and the, the crowd's all murmuring and everything's going this way, that way, or whatever, and there will be one person, and not necessarily the hero. Sometimes it's just a single mom or whatever, but she'll stand up and she'll say, no, I'm going to do this for my children. And what happens? Instantly, it changes the room. It changes the crowd because one, one person stood up and said, I'm going to follow the Lord. I'm going to serve Jesus in this. And, and bam, it's like a lightning bolt just goes through everybody. Well, now we've got 600 men, okay? That's 600 in a bottle instead of four in a bottle. It's a better, better victory for Saul. It's not his thousands or ten thousands, but it's 600. So David and his men, about 600, arose and departed from Keilah and went wherever they could go. <laughs> it's kind of scattered like cockroaches. Then it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, so he halted the expedition. Okay? Um, as we mentioned last week, it's in this time, his wilderness wanderings, uh, some people tag this, this time of his life, over a decade, when he's being groomed to be a king. He's being groomed to lead. He's being groomed to rule over the nation of Israel. He's being groomed to be the shepherd of God's people, what does God do? Takes him to the wilderness. Never, you know anybody else that God has ever done that with? He did that with Moses, 40 years on the backside of the desert. I need you to lead my people. Okay, okay, well, how are we going to do this? Well, I want you to watch sheep for 40 years out there in the desert. That's the training you're going to need for what you're about to do. And David's just going through the training he's going to need to become uh, a good leader. But not only that, it gives him time to write. It gives him time to uh, compose his music. As we said last week, uh, a huge number of David's psalms are, are composed during this time in the wilderness. In fact, right here, when they have scattered from Keilah and they're out in the wilderness, everybody's going his own way, this is where David wrote Psalm 18. And you could look at the superscription. Okay, remember I said... In the scriptures, you'll have these little titles in most of your Bibles that say this next section is about this. That's man-made. That's added. But often, your Bible will have in a very small font uh, a superscription, something just prior, say, to the psalm. This is a psalm that David wrote while he was fleeing from uh, Saul and with his mighty men, right? And that's how we know that he wrote Psalm 18 during this episode right here. So you can go back and read Psalm 18, and it's like it reads right into this, and you can get more color and more detail. I'm not going to do that right now because uh, it's a pretty long psalm, okay? Uh, but if we get far enough tonight, I'll read a part of it a little bit later. Chapter four, or ch verse 14, pardon me. And David stayed in strongholds in the wilderness and remained in the mountains in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. I forgot to bring my little maps, my little pictures out. Would you want to go in my office? I think they're either on the table or by my office. Um, just because there's so much geography, topography. He's traveling here, he's traveling there. I, I copied a little picture of David's journeys through the book, or through his wilderness wanderings. And it's kind of correlated to the chapters that we're in. So now he's on Ziph. He's, he's over near uh, the Salt Sea, the, the, the Dead Sea. 
and uh, he's coming into this area. Ziph is going to play a big role in his life over the next couple chapters here. But he comes into this area, um, and it's in the wilderness. Often in the Bible, it also would say the desert, depending on which version uh, of your English that you would have. And desert, better translated, I like wilderness here, really means an uninhabited region. It doesn't necessarily mean that it is um, dry and, and drought stricken, as many Bibles sometimes will say in the desert. Um, a lot of times the wilderness, and we know that very well, can be forested, you know. It could be, uh, it could be the Arctic, not in the Bible, but in the definition of wilderness, just an uninhabited region. So uh, the wilderness of Ziph, and it says in a forest, okay. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. And so they met together and they had just sweet fellowship, no doubt. There was a lot of prayer and praise and thanksgiving, hugs and tears and uh, just sharing what God is doing in my life and your life. And it's so, so cool to have your David and your Jonathan, um, uh, you know, as gals, your Martha and your Mary. I don't know if that's the right combination per se. But those people that you go to for strength and encouragement, and you can just get that refreshing. And Jonathan comes out and finds him and strengthens him. He builds him up. You're good. You're in God's hand. God's taking care of you. Thank you, Cheryl. So um, can you see Ziff on your map here? Um, it's kind of on the lower section there, uh, heading over towards the Dead Sea. Anyways, just in the, the hills going down towards the Dead Sea, uh, a wooded region. Um, and Jonathan has come out to meet him. Verse 19. Uh, then the Ziphites um, came up to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding with us in strongholds in the woods in the hill of Hakilah, which is on the south of Jeshimon? Now therefore, O king, Come down according to all the desire of your soul to come down, and our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. So another set of rats, right? No doubt they're doing this for position, prestige, prize. They want the, they want the trophies. They want the treasure. They want, they want to be on the king's good side. And so this is their way of advancing their personal hand is to take out David. Verse 21, And Saul said, Blessed are you of the Lord. Really? I mean, seriously, you're ratting out God's anointed, then, and I don't think that's, that's a blessing of the Lord. For you have compassion on me. Please go and find out for sure and see the place where his hideout is and who has seen him there. For I am told he's very crafty. See, therefore, and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hides and come back to me with certainty, and I will go with you, and it shall be, if he is in the land, that I will search for him throughout all the clans of Judah. Now, Ziph was a clan of Judah, a, a, a descendant of Judah. The 12 tribes of Israel, one of them was Judah. Ziph was a descendant. David is a descendant. They're all descendants here in the land of Judah. So it's kind of like brother on brother, or cousin on cousin, but uh, they're doing each other dirty here, at least the people of Ziph, verse 24. So they rose and went to Ziph before Saul, but David and his men were in the wilderness of Naon, in the plain on the south, south of Jeshimon. When Saul and his men went to seek him, they told David, therefore he went down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued David in the wilderness of Maon. Then Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. So David made haste to get, it, get away from Saul, for Saul and his men were encircling David and his men to take them. But a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Therefore Saul returned from pursuing David and went against the Philistines. So they, they, so they called that place the Rock of Escape. Then David went up from there and dwelt in the strongholds at Engedi. Okay? So a couple things in this. So they're out there in the wilderness, and people are ratting them out wherever they go. And this is just a, it's really a picture of David's life. And it's a snapshot. Remember, there's over a decade that's going to be compressed into a handful of chapters here. There's a lot that goes on in a decade. 
There's a lot that goes on in 10 days. If I asked you what has happened in the last 10 days in your life, you could tell me all kinds of stories, ups and downs and sideways and all these kinds of things. Well, David and his men, they're out in the wilderness for over 10 years on the run from Saul. But these highlight some of the places, especially where God's hand is there. And here, they're, they're way out on the mountainous slopes going down towards the Dead Sea. Saul comes. He's on one side of the mountain. He's about to get him. He's encircling him. It's like curtains. They've got him in the pincer move. They're toast. And then, coincidence of coincidences, there are no coincidences, right? There's God's providence, the Philistines attack. And all of a sudden, Saul, and let me say this and, and challenge me on this and go do your homework. And again, there's a lot that happens in all this that we don't have recorded. But as far as we see recorded, when have we seen Saul initiate an attack on the Philistines? It's Jonathan. It's David. Now, now, Saul decides he's going to go get the Philistines. Okay? But for whatever reason, okay, God draws Saul and the armies away just as, about they're, as they're about to pounce on David, and David and his men escape. Okay? And the picture is just to see the big picture, what God is doing in the world, right? Because so many times we're in our own wilderness. We're just wandering. We're trying to make it from place to place and time to time. We've got people chasing us, ratting us out, giving us a hard time. Life isn't easy. The enemy's always dogging us. And, and, and I don't mean it like um, necessarily that everybody's life is pure tragedy all the way. But... <laughs> If you're out there doing stuff for the Lord, if you're a David and you're going to war for God, you know it, you know it, that God just brings opposition constantly. And if it's not you, if you're just, you know, basically a, you've got a seat in the stadium and you're watching the show, even then you can pull up your phone and scroll or look at TV and you'll see all kinds of attacks coming against uh, God's people all around the world, and all kinds of victories where God has sailed in and done something amazing and nobody even saw it coming. And, and these things continue to this very day. God is moving, and the purpose of reading these stories is for us to put ourselves in David's shoes and see God is on the throne, God is answering, God is moving. I said I was going to read out of Psalm uh, 18, uh, and I'll just read a, a couple verses out of the middle of it. Psalm 18, verse 31, remember, he's at Ma'on. He's at the uh, rock of escape, okay? They went to the rock. And here in Psalm 18, David writes in verse 31, Who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and he sets me on my high places. He teaches my hands to make war, so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. David's not taking credit for this. God is the commander of the army of the Lord. Just as Joshua found out when he encountered him before the fall of Jericho, it's really God who goes before us. And as we go through the scriptures and chronicles, we find that God's going before uh, the children of Israel. The battle belongs to the Lord, and, and David knows this well. He chronicles it in many of his psalms. In Psalm 18, uh, another passage in verse 46, The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God who avenges me and subdues peoples under my feet. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above, above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises in your name. Great deliverance he gives to his king. He shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. Okay? And I'll go back to the superscription at the beginning of Psalm 18. I didn't bring that in. But it says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, a servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of his song on the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, and then we start the song. So this is how we can see. We can put these psalms together, and this is what David is writing about these events in his life. So it's kind of cool. Chapter 24. Now it happened, and now 
maybe a year later, right? Or a week later, or you have to look for your time stamps. You kind of try to identify, did it say now, okay, does that mean like right now while they're at the rock, or now there's another story being introduced? Let's look and see if we can find out. Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. It's reasonable to think it's just sometime within, I don't know, however long it took Saul to go whoop up on the Philistines and get back home, right? So within a month, let's say, or it's in that time stamp, that time frame. Uh, but David's in En Gedi. Now, it doesn't show that on this map. I don't, maybe it does. Yeah, yeah. Right it's right on the coast, En Gedi there. And it's a beautiful, beautiful place to go. The Dead Sea is one of the most barren, harsh, nasty, dead places you can go on the earth. It's just, it's covered with salt and crusted with just all kinds of minerals. Nothing, nothing grows there. But there are little canyons that flow down out of the Judean hills into the Dead Sea. And you get deep into these canyons, into these wadis, and down in the bottom there are streams that will come out, intermittent streams or even uh, annual streams or that come continually. And there's one called En Gedi. En Gedi means uh, the kids or kids of goats, right? Little, the little goats. Because there's a lot of this uh, goat type animal that lives in the cliffs and the rocks in this canyon. So it's known as the canyon or the cliff or the place of En Gedi, the place of the little kids. But it is just like a tropical paradise when you get into this slot. From outside, you don't even know there's anything there. It's just dry, barren. If you've ever been to Death Valley or Badlands or someplace, it's just nothing. And then you drive up and you go into this slot and all of a sudden it's, it's literally tropical. Okay, the Dead Sea is, can't remember, almost 2,000 feet below sea level, okay? So it's, it's like a hyperbaric chamber, okay? It's got a much higher air pressure. The humidity and the heat, the temperatures there make everything super tropical. Not only do they have palms, but they have bananas, mangoes. It's crazy. It's like a tropical jungle. This is Engedi. And these waterfalls coming down, it's a beautiful place. What a great place for David and his guys to hang out, okay? I just bring that out, kind of a little um, geography tour guide thing. If you get to Israel, it's a good place to go see. So they, they're in, in Gedi, uh, the rock of the wild goats. Verse 3, so he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave. And Saul went in to attend to his needs, okay? That's an euphemism. You, you know what a euphemism is? It's a nice way to say something that we don't want to say publicly. Okay? He had to relieve himself. Okay? He had to uh, go to the bathroom, basically. Uh, literally, when it says uh, um, uh, he went in to attend to his needs, literally it said to cover his feet. Um, he had to drop his robes. Okay? Is what happened here. So he's rather vulnerable, is the point. Okay? And David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. So little does he know, and he goes in, and anyways, verse 4. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterward that David's heart was troubled him, because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing his, he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. This is, I know a story, if you've been around Christianity for any length of time, you've heard of at least in some degree, or you've read your scriptures and you know the story. But uh, just an amazing thing. Now, cutting off the corner of a robe, uh, anybody that was a person of authority, Joseph had a robe of authority. Uh, Moses had a robe of authority. Jesus, even, the woman would try to touch the hem of his robe, the hem of his garment, because that was where the power symbolically resided. And it would be much like a uh, uh, military or police or somebody putting on something and it would have the 
uh, stripes or whatever on the epaulets. They would have these symbols of authority. And that was what this represented. And to cut that off, if you can imagine sneaking up to a general and cutting off his badges, you know, you've got the, the sense of what David's done here. Now, it's pretty amazing that he's able to get that close. Uh, it lets me think that David would be a really good hunting buddy because he would <laughs> he'd know how to get in close to whatever it is you're trying to get on to, and he would have had to have been pretty good that way. And it's very possible that Saul was not um, that attentive or that um, maybe he had a hearing issue. I don't know. All these things I speculate when I read. Do you do that when you read? It's like, how can you do that? But the, the, the sum total is he did it. Maybe Saul dropped his robe over there and then he went over here and it's closer to where David is. We don't know. But however it happened, David gets the idea, I'm going to cut off the corner of his robe. And that's a way of, of showing that, well, let's look at it and see. It'll tell us what it shows. But it's a way of kind of getting revenge, but not revenge. It actually is, is David is trying to help Saul. He's still trying to win Saul. He's still trying to convince Saul, I'm, I'm not the bad guy here. Verse 8, David arose afterward and went out of the cave and called out to Saul, saying, My lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped uh, with his face to the earth and bowed down. Okay, so either he's, he's pulling a quick one on him and he's trying to bluff him, or this is David. And we'll see, this is David. He's still... This is amazing, you know. It's very, very difficult sometimes for us to serve under somebody who's a tyrant, somebody who is just brutal. And yet David has that heart that says, I serve God, and if God has put me in this position, I'll do it to the best of my ability. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of the men who say, Indeed, David seeks your harm? Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave. And someone urged me to kill you, but my eye spared you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, know that, know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you, yet you hunt my life to take it. Verse 12. Let the Lord judge between you and me. And this is what David is trying to do. And let the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancient says, wickedness proceeds from the wicked, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom the king of Israel, after whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? A dead dog, a flea? Therefore, let the Lord be judge, and judge between you and me, and see, and plead my case, and deliver me out of your hand. And so David's put down a, a wonderful defense, right? I, I don't want to get overly political, but I bet somebody in the room has been watching the news recently, and the trials that are going on in the news, and the judges, and the prosecutors, and the defense, and, and, and all these things. And wouldn't it be beautiful if we could just say, let the Lord judge. Let the Lord judge what is right here. But, you know, everybody's trying to get their angle on it. And David's like, no, no, no. I'm content to let God take care of this. Um, Shiloh was talking to me just as we were coming in before the thing. And uh, the conversation went to how do you keep your calm or act so cool or not freak out when some of these things happen around here? And I'm like, well, I'm not sure that it, I think partly it's just my nature, the way God's created me. But at the end of the day, I, I pray, I, I'd like to think I'm learning that it's better to leave it up to the Lord. I, I, a, I hate drama. I just don't want to jump into anybody else's thing. Um, so that's one way I stay out of it. But at the end of the day, God usually does such a better job than I would have done. You know, and I, I always ask myself two things. What's my role in this? And what can I do? And the first thing is, what's my role? Because I might, can do something, but maybe I shouldn't. It's not my place. So the first thing, do, do I even have a place in here? And if I do have a place in here, what's my role? In, what can I do? What should I do? And what parts do I need to leave to God? Because God, God's got this, okay? Even if I blow it, God's still got it. And so even, that's, that's kind of my release valve. Like, what if you don't do what you're supposed to do? Well... 
And God's going to do what he's supposed to do. So at the end of the day, God wins. But I don't want to go in there and get on the wrong team. And so, and David's doing kind of the similar type of a thing here. Um, that pro proverb, wickedness, proceeds from the wicked. It's, it's, that's not hard. That's not difficult to figure out. You know, what trees simply bear the fruit of what kind of tree they are, right? Or uh, we read, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, okay? If, if you're wicked, wickedness is going to come out. If you're not, it's not going to come out. I used to use this illustration with my sixth graders. Um, often, I, at least one time during the school year, usually early on in the school year, I take a nice, tall, clear glass uh, of water, and I would tell, and I would, I would also take a, a glass of, and I can't even remember what the chemical is right now, but it was a really caustic chemical, a city chemical, and I could like put a piece of paper in there, and, you know, the paper would be all nasty. And I would take that glass of water and I say, now what's going to happen when I knock it over? Right? And the kids are, oh, oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do terrible stuff, right? And I could take, and I would pick up the glass, the one with water, and I would throw it at them, right? But in a classroom, they only also get a little drop, a drop on them or whatever. And, but they're, ah, we're going to die. It's like, no, it's water. And the point is, it's whatever's in you that's going to come out when you get jostled, tumbled, knocked, whenever something hits you, what's going to come out what's naturally in you? If you have a potty mouth and something bad happens, somebody cuts you off on the road, what comes out of your mouth? Potty, right? You're a potty mouth, okay? And, and, and it's, just, it's just, it's a picture of that. I used to be a potty mouth, okay? God has helped me deliver me from that. Um, somebody came up to me once and he goes, you know, it's not that intelligent to use all of that dirty language. Um, a kid can do it. Why don't you try to say what you really mean instead? Like really use a sentence to describe how you're feeling or expressing what you're trying to say. That's hard. You know, what it ends up making you do is stop and think a lot. And a lot of times you don't say anything at all because you can't even think of what you want to say. It's so hard to get there. But over time, you start actually using your words. Look at that guy driving right in front of me. He's going to get in a wreck. We're all going to be in danger here. Or something like that, right? But if that's what's in you, that's what's going to come out of you. In David's case, David has a heart after God. In Saul's case, here comes another spear, right? It's just who, who they are. Um, so what are you chasing after? A dead dog? A flea? Really? How much of a... I, I'm not a threat to you at all. In fact, I'm an asset to you. But at the very least, I'm just I'm trying to stay as far away from you as I can. I'm no threat to you whatsoever. I'm out here in the wilderness in a cave. Seriously? Just leave me alone. Okay? Um, let the Lord judge. Verse 16. So it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul that Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Okay. So clearly, Saul is having some mental health issues, okay? Um, and, and a lot of this, we saw. It, it began as he started to read his own publicity, you know, press releases. He started believing he was all that. He started out humble. He was a really great guy. But then it just really went to his head. And before it went, then it, it went to his heart and it just corrupted him inside. To now, he's so self-obsessed that it's affecting him physically, mentally, emotionally. And it's really, really sad when you see people who have caved in on themselves. You know what I'm talking about? You ever met somebody like that? You know, it doesn't usually happen terribly, at least until the 20s or 30s. But more often than not, you start seeing it um, in older age, and especially when you get to some really old people. And you just, yeah, years and years and years of this, they just become dark and bitter and distrustful and mean and ornery. And, and it's like, man, that's what a lifetime of this does to you. Don't do it. Don't go that way, you know. Um, at any rate, uh, so it was when David had finished speaking these words. Is that you, my son, David? And Saul lifted his voice and wept. Then David said, you are more... 
You are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. Now, that would be really hard to say if you're in that situation. David's on the run. He's been pinned so many times. Saul has killed the whole city of Nob, priests and chickens and all, right? And yet here David has said, you're more righteous than I. And he's talking about that moment and that incident. In that incident, Saul's done nothing wrong. David cut off a corner of his garment. So David is trying to make any kind of inroad, any kind of bridge, any kind of thing to say, look, you know, to bring him back, to win him back. There's still hope for you. There's still good in you. I still believe in you. I still am trying to win you back. And so he's using this comparison. Um, uh, verse 18, And you've shown this day how you have dwelt with me, for when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him get away safely? Therefore, may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. Now, this is, again, this is really hard, but... I, I'm looking at Dallas right now, and I'm not picking on him, but I think of so many people that I get into ministry with, and we start walking down the road, and we start finding ourselves in situations where we're in a, in a place with a bad person. And one of the things I always talk about, or we have conversations about, is if you're going to be in ministry, if you're going to be in leadership, if you're going to be mentoring and discipling people, if you're going to be doing these types of things, you need to learn to eat crow. You need to learn to like it, because you're going to eat a lot of it. Even you, you, you know what I mean by eating crow, right? It, it's just swallowing that which is really unpleasant and putting a smile on your face and doing what's best for that other person who doesn't deserve any of it. But then again, isn't that what Jesus does for us? <laughs> continually swallowing no doubt and going <sighs> you know that Mike how many times do I have to tell him this and yet I'm gonna eat crow one more time for him I'm gonna go to the cross you know I, I all all of the above so David's really walking that walk out it's kind of cool uh, verse 20 and you know Indeed, that you shall surely be king, and the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Therefore, swear to me now by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me, and that you will not destroy my name from my father's house. So David swore to Saul, and Saul went home, but, but David and his went, men went up to the stronghold. So again, another truce, truce right? Um, but just keep in mind, making a truce with Saul is like making a truce with Hamas or Hezbollah or ISIS, or whatever. This is just, it, it means nothing. Uh, especially when you're dealing with a madman, okay? And, and he's not in his right mind. And so it's just not going to stick. It's not going to go very far. Um, I meant to only do two chapters tonight because I didn't want to take us too long. Um, and I might do that. Um, Yeah, I think I'm going to do that. If I get into this next part, we're not going to be able to do it justice. And the next chapter is really, 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 really fun. Really, really good. Um, and, and so are some other parts here. But here we've seen David. He's on the run, and yet he's kept his heart in the right place. He's already anointed. He knows he's going to be king. Um, and if he's going to be king, how should he treat a king? How would you want to be treated, right? I think these are some of the things that we look at. Um, in ministry, it's kind of interesting how often we see people who aspire to positions of leadership and that they go about it in the worldly sort of way, trying to cut somebody's feet out from under them or organizing a political coup and splitting a group of people over so they can get followers and these kinds of things. Obviously wrong, yeah, and yet when we say obvious, it's, it's not necessarily obvious to the people involved. If the heart that you have towards people is to serve them and lift them up, whether they're your king or just your neighbor, your spouse, your children, if you'll do that, you'll always land up right. You'll always, you'll always turn out good, and God will shake it all out. 
and bring about his perfect will in these situations. Um, and, and, and David is a person that has a heart that just, just leans into God, trusts God, and, uh, and he lives it out in, in some pretty challenging situations. Um, anybody here lived in the wilderness for any length of time? <laughs> You know, I, and, and, and especially on the run. How many of you have been fugitives living in the wilderness, right? With, with mobs that are trying to take your life, right? In, in, in a circumstance like that, it would be really easy for me to get bitter and to seek revenge and these kinds of things. And David doesn't do that to his credit. And I just want you to put that down in the positive sign. Because we're looking at David, we're looking at the life of David, and David is going to have some big negatives in his life. You do know that. Uh, yeah. I mean, and yet, how does God even keep dealing with a guy who does such stupid stuff? Stop and think of all the wonderful things he does, and, and recognize that there's none of us. There's not one that does it perfect, Okay. The Bible is just a story of a whole bunch of messed up people and God, okay? And so in this, God wins, and, and that's this picture of David. But here's some really beautiful things about David, somebody you'd want to have as a friend, okay? Um, so at any rate, let's go ahead and we'll pray. Father God, we want to thank you for the lessons we're learning here. Uh, Lord, we, we recognize that um, none of us have probably lived a life like David, but we have our own lives to live. We have our own trials. And I pray, Lord, that by watching David and learning, you would give us that, that heart that seeks good and seeks to honor you and seeks to trust you and seeks to step back and let you fight the battles for us. Help us, Lord, to recognize that if we will just put our faith in you, you will, you will take care of us. I just, I, I, again, I just, I pray that because I, I do see in this world today so many people in so many battles and uh, hard for us sometimes. It, when we're in the battles, Lord, I know, Lord, when I'm in the battle, I forget this stuff and I need friends around me to remind me. It, the battle belongs to you. Help me to surrender to you quicker and sooner and more completely that uh, we, can, we can get to your uh, perfect will. So again, we thank you for tonight and this opportunity to just take a minute in your word. Uh, we pray that it would uh, conform us into the image of your Son, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen.